Hello adventurers and welcome back to my channel. Today we are at the beautiful campus of the College of the Ozarks where we're about to go check out a very interesting museum. Now on campus they have a lot of different things that you can do and I've shared a few of those things on my channel previously. Go check out my Keter Center video. Oh my goodness, the best food ever. But while on campus here at Hard Work U, they also have the Ralph Foster Museum. The museum itself is absolutely awesome and it has something very special and very significant to the Branson area right inside these doors. So let's go check it out. Okay guys, we picked up our ticket and it was $8 for an adult. And then I also picked up this, which we're gonna look at in just a minute. But while we're in here, some super cool stuff. This is actually one of the reasons why I love coming out to College of the Ozarks, because notice all of these products. Well, it's not just a gift shop. These are actually made by the students by hand here on campus. There are so many goodies here that you can find around the campus that the students learn to make. Now, Hard Work U is a little bit different than most college campuses. You actually can come here tuition free, but you learn a skill and you have to actually work on campus. And so you'll see students in all of the buildings here that are accessible to the public working to earn their tuition. But with that said, let's move around and check out some of these awesome displays. Now, as we move into the first gallery, I did want to open this up and show you what's inside. There's a few interesting little pieces here, but this is a two-hand situation, so let's get this open. As you open this, you see something very familiar. This is actually the Beverly Hillbillies car, and we will be seeing that it is a 1921 Oldsmobile model 4. Six, so 46, and um, it's going to be on display here in the museum. Now, it's in fact in the very room that we're standing in, but I'm gonna show it to you in just a few minutes. I wanna be able to tell the story as to why this is located here. But while we're looking through, you'll notice there's also educational programs that they offer. And inside of this pamphlet right here, there is, in fact, a map. That's right. This shows all three floors and collection areas and you can kind of go through here and see what some of the main items that they want you to focus on through some of these photos and this is super handy. Now they do have this where it's super accessible so you can go up through a series of ramps, stairs, or elevators to get from floor to floor and so I think this is a great one for anyone who is coming to the Branson area who wants a little sense of nostalgia and then also to gain some brain wrinkles. So with that said, let's go get some brain wrinkles. You'll notice over here right to our right as soon as we walk in there's the golden age of music Missouri style and it has the story of the Grand Ole Opry. Throughout this case you will find a slew of creatives who have made their mark on music throughout the years and many of those people have been from this area. In fact the story of Missouri making its way to Nashville is pretty well documented throughout time and history. Now this room is called the Cy Simon Music Room and here you can learn a little bit more about Mr. Cy Simon himself. This is the man, the myth, and the legend. Simon's music room actually chronicles all of the Ozark past and here you can see some of not only those wonderful music things that we started off with but also a little bit more about the man behind this room. Here we have some various items here from the Ozark Jubilee and then also some certificates from the Conservation Corps, some guitars, some photos, some really interesting pieces in this case right here. Here you find Mr. Cy Simon and Rosie and as you're kind of looking along through here you'll notice a few other familiar faces like Willie Nelson, Always On My Mind, Country Music Association recognizing Always On My Mind, in fact, right here as one of the songs of the year. And if you'll notice, Rosebridge Music Incorporated. That name should sound familiar because it ties all of these pieces together. On display is a 1901 to 1929 Victrola, and this is beautiful. The wood still bears its beautiful patterns. A few of the knobs have been removed, however, it is absolutely amazing to see. This display case documents the times of Brenda Lee, and for those who aren't familiar with Brenda Lee, Brenda Lee has a little song called Jambalaya. You can see some of the photos of Brenda Lee participating in Hee Haw, also alongside Minnie Pearl here, and as you look, you can see she's even been on the Dick Clark show. She was inducted into the Hall of Fame, 
And she started out as a young child and made her mark on the industry. In fact, I could go case by case and show you all of the amazing photos and accomplishments. These are all memories from the Ozark Jubilee. And as you're looking through these, you see time unfolding from the 1950s on all the way up to the 1982 time. In these hallowed halls of the Ralph Foster, you can find Johnny Cash and Patsy Cline. You can see Barbara Fairchild. You can see Don Sullivan. So many famous faces. I really appreciate this contribution. This is Dolly Parton, but not just any version of Dolly Parton. This is actually one of the biggest things that she has done to help all children throughout the world. In fact, Dolly Parton decided that she was going to take her fame and turn it into something super positive. And she used her dad as her motivator and created the Imagination Library. In this program, children can receive one book a month for absolute free. And this is a wonderful way that children are able to learn to read at a young age and have fun doing it. As we travel through each one of these rooms, you'll notice there are tons of different things. And I really appreciate that in the music room, they have so many different, not only albums and records, but they also have the musical instruments which have been used throughout time to create some of the sounds that we love even today. And so as you're going around, it's a really good glimpse through music history here in the Ozarks, and I love that. Now this one right here is especially interesting. Here in front of us we have a very visual circle, but the closer that we get to this visual circle, the more you can notice there are details. In fact, each one of these are individual songs, and this is part of the Wayne Carson legacy. All of these songs were in some way, shape, or form impacted by Wayne Carson. Of course, the most infamous being Always On My Mind, made super popular by Willie Nelson. It's even graced coca-cola bottles and as you kind of move around you notice his contributions have been so vast and have affected much of modern music even today as we move to this section we find mr. Ralph Foster himself this is a recreation of his office and you can see he enjoyed the great outdoors the woodsy feel in here with the dark woods, the minerals, the rocks, lots of interesting photos, a few very interesting things on his walls. This is very neat. Now, Mr. Ralph Foster had quite a legacy of his own. In fact, he worked in broadcasting. Here you can see in 2017, he was inducted into the Hall of Fame for broadcasting. And it says on some of these little displays around that he actually had a little place that he called home and he he had a little broadcast studio area in the back of that until he later moved on to a larger area in Springfield. So it's really cool to see how this particular room is the first one I chose just by random to come into, but I think it puts the most context into the man, the myth, the legend, and also the music that makes us all smile. Now as we depart the music room, we enter into this beautiful sharing of quilts. The quilts here are gorgeous and they line all of the different areas of the rooms around standing tall with different patterns and beautiful colors. And this is a very special gallery because this is an art gallery. And a lot of people, whenever they look at a quilt, don't understand the storytelling that has happened through the individual quilting squares. So today we're gonna go and check those out and see exactly what I'm talking about. Wow, look at these. This exhibit is called Legacy of Love Quilt Exhibit. And here you have a few quilting squares, but as we move along the rows here, we'll find out a little bit more information about the story behind quilting. When you look at this, what do you see? Well, I see a bunch of flower sacks, but during the 1930s, fabric became a luxury. Many women began creating clothing and quilt tops out of cotton flower sacks because they were available. When the flower companies realized this, they began printing the sacks with more patterns so that they could create more interesting and intricate designs. 
here we learn a little bit more about the needle and thread and different kinds of quilting stitches. And along the way, it has a numerical order of various kinds of stitches, such as the straight line quilting, the template stitching, the free motion quilting, and it tells us what each one of those would look like and also why they would use it. Now, one other thing before we look at the designs themselves, each quilt has a little placard next to it telling a little bit more about why this quilt was created and then also some of the stitches and a little backstory behind it. So like this one for example says it's called the Rolling Stone Quilt and it is considered to be an excellent compilation of rolling squares and rolling stars and they are mild cousins. The Rolling Stone pattern that we're seeing over here dates relatively back 150 years to the late 1800s. It was a favorite of pioneer quilters. Now this particular design is called the lollipop swirl and the origins of this one are a bit more vague. They say though that each individual piece toward the center of the spiral has to be done by hand. This is considered to be extremely detailed and intricate work but you can see it maintains a very fun and whimsical appearance. Here we have a pansy design, and it was said that this was actually a very popular design for homemakers. Now through each one of these, I think you're able to see the differences and the design and the texture and also in the fabrics that they're using. But this one is actually called a double chain, a double Irish chain. And it was very common in the late 1800s for women in America to create this particular style. However, the first official documentation of this particular style was way back in 1814. Believe it or not though, this pattern actually dates far past that. 1785 was the original date of the first time that this particular style was in fact created. Now this is a very graphic print right here and it's considered to be a log cabin style. And despite the fact that it's called a log cabin style, some of the earliest variations of this actually were dated back toward the Egyptians. The Egyptian mummies actually frequently had a pattern very similar to this. Okay, this is a pattern I think even I could do. This is called the staggered brick or scrappy quilt. And it was designed to be a very simple design. It's an offset of every other brick. It's not highly intricate and the quilter is free to make certain pieces longer or shorter. So there is no wrong way to assemble this. Now the top part I think I could totally do. It's the quilting that goes into the back end that would be hard for me. I also personally love this because it's so vibrant and bright and is most associated with the Great Depression when scraps were pretty much all that they had. They didn't have a ton of bolted cloth and fabric, so doing something like this with just whatever they had left over became the new norm, and I love this. Now this one is very different. This one was actually popular between the 1920s and the 1940s. It is called a yo-yo quilt. And you can see each one of these little pieces is kind of gathered together before it's attached. Very interesting indeed. And because we love a good interaction, they actually have an interactive space here that you can create your own quilting pattern, which is super cool. Now how they create these beautiful patterns, however, is a different story. And so around the room, you have a variety of different antique sewing machines. These would have been used to help them be able to do some of the design work and make it a little bit easier so everything didn't have to be hand stitched. In fact, the sewing machine itself has a very fascinating story behind it, and they do expand on that a little bit here in this gallery through some of the signage. Departing the quilting area and moving into farm equipment. There's a lot of different items here that would have been used on the farm or in the industries of the time. So here we're gonna get some looks at some of the different things. And some of these things, if you've been watching my channel, should be a little bit familiar. So I'm gonna show you a few of them, but you have to come and check them out for yourself to see some of the others because there's a lot in here, guys. Like this right here, this is actually a cream separator and it would separate the cream from the milk. And you can see there are several different little chambers here and then there is a crank also. Next to that we have a washing machine. Now, in modern days we just put the stuff in there, we put the little fabric softener and everything in and leave it to be. 
but when you did laundry in the past it was a very intentional thing and in fact you would have to be the power behind the ring out and also the churn. Thank goodness that is not the case now because I already don't love doing laundry even though it is simple so that would just be hard. Here we have a steam engine, and this is absolutely beautiful. This came from Van Buren, Arkansas, and around it you can see the shimmering shininess. There is actually a photo of when it would have been in use originally, and then also they have the series number right here on the back. Now this display doesn't translate as well onto camera because it's a darker corner, but in person this thing is spectacular, guys. This is actually a Springfield wagon that came from Springfield, which is of course right up the road. This has iron tires. Items used in the settlement and development of the Ozarks was very common in the small communities. The blacksmith services included much more than shoeing horses. Behind us is a cabin and it does say that we can go in, but it says watch our steps. So it's pretty dark in there. Let's see what happens. Let's see what, oh, the light came on. Oh, wow. This is great. Not only do they have the interactive exhibits, but they also have the things that talk to you and then the things that you can immerse yourself in. And one of the things that I'm really liking about this is that around the room, you're seeing these little tags everywhere. Those are numbers or letters. And then there's a corresponding sheet on the wall that tells you what each individual thing is. Just past the cabin, we take the stairs to the next floor. Oh, wow. Guys, this is insanely amazing. Look at how this is set up. Now, along the walls, you'll notice these are cases upon cases of various kinds of rifles and guns. They also have a barbed wire display on this level. Very cool. Now, I typically am not a huge person on guns. However, I do see that history is playing out throughout each one of these walls. And I think that that's very important to learn from the past so we can make better tomorrows and also learn to educate ourselves about the things around us. So I'm gonna show you a few of the things that stand out to me in this room, but this is one that will take some time and for all of my gun enthusiasts who do watch this channel, definitely come here because, oh my goodness, they're everywhere. I think we will start off though with this one. This is the Andrew Jackson commemorative pistol. And Andrew Jackson was actually born in 1767 in South Carolina. He ended up representing Tennessee's first congressional representative state in 1796. And he was serving in the US House of Representatives. He went on to serve for the Senate and then later became the president. Now this particular collector has several commemorative guns as well. Um, Robert E. Lee commemorative gun right here. And then this one just really was interesting to me because it has a little piece of history here from the 16th to 18th century wheel lock firearms. And you can see how it works, but then here you can actually see the intricacies of the gun itself, which I think are very interesting. Now, the collection that they have assembled here is, again, spectacular, but there are a few other things that are behind closed doors that are non-access zones. This is amazing to see, though. These are just incredible. And let me show you what I can show you from this door. Do you see this? Again, amazing to see this level of a collection and you can see just the variations and it's so interesting. Of course, in the room, they also have a few pieces of taxidermy. You can learn about each one of these animals through the attached sign that they have in the display. This is a pronghorn, for example. 
There is also a polar bear here. And then of course, this guy right here is the guy that all of us campers hope we never see in person, the grizzly bear. This case right here is filled with seldom seen guns. Again, each one having their own descriptor. Very interesting things here, definitely. As we move past this first door, we go into yet another room filled with, oh my goodness, look at all of these. Along these cases, Winchester guns throughout the years. And as you can imagine, there are a lot of them. In fact, the Winchester display here is mammoth and definitely something that, again, if you're a gun enthusiast, you have to come and see. They even have a little display here with Mr. Bat Masterson and some of the notorious outlaws of the West pocket-sized derringers. Some of these are only even a couple of inches long. If you like history, come here because they have information about the Younger Gang. And even Pancho Villa has made his way into the Ralph Foster Museum. But as much as they do have display upon display of guns and more guns, they also talk about the implementation of why guns became so popular and what guns were used and how guns were used to defend territories and to take territories. And as you're kind of going through here, you can see pieces of that history unfold through story on these displays and tableaus. So definitely take some time because I could literally be in this one gallery for a whole day. It's big. Now, as we pass through this section, we actually enter in a section that is about war. And there's a focus on the various troops that have come from this particular area. And there are also some artifacts and items that are here that show us what the experience would have been like to have participated in any one of these conflicts. Now, this is an area that I think we should take a little bit of time with because it is pretty expansive. This area begins with the Persian Gulf and Operation Desert Storm. Now, through each each conflict, the camo that they use actually changes to reflect the area that they are in. So you'll notice that these are like the sand tan. And there are some very interesting pieces in this display. Like right here, we have the MREs or the meals ready to eat. Now over to the side, it actually tells you what each one of these packages are. And you'll notice that it is a cocoa beverage powder and a cherry base powder, peaches that were dried, crackers, brownies, all sorts of things that would get your calorie intake for the day. A fun fact, I personally eat something kind of similar to these. If you ever have picked up a freeze-dried meal or a mountain house meal, you've eaten something that's similar to what the troops have had at some point in time. In fact, mountain house works directly with the military to provide meals for the troops. And so that's kind of a cool way that you can relate these different things to one another. Uh oh, another light came on. Let's see what's going on. The light actually came on before this family who's sitting in front of their television. This is the Vietnam War timeline area, and the Vietnam War was the first war that was highly televised and brought war directly into the living room and made it a real tangible thing for most people who were at home. Because of this, the headlines were gruesome. It was terrible. It was horrific to see what was going on, but that was what was actually happening, and it has really shaped how we perceive and see news even today in way of conflict. This next section actually shows someone helping another person while in the field and it talks about the MASH areas or the mobile army surgical hospitals that would pop up. Of course, most of us are familiar with those because of the sitcom that actually came out, the MASH sitcom. Now here we have a Berea gun and this was from around 1890. You can see it is a very interesting looking thing that they would have to wheel out and then would have little rounds that would go in and be able to power through two at a time through this little cannon-like gun barrel. Here we have a display where you can actually sit down in these chairs and watch people as they talk about the impact that visiting some of these historic places have given them in way of connection to the past. And around the room you'll see several of the service uniforms also. So while you're moving around this room, take in those voices, listen to their stories. They're absolutely heart-wrenching and you can see that the real emotion that's coming across their face because of their experiences has changed them. This is a Gatlin gun. Although it was not the first weapon ever devised of its kind to do multi-firing, 
it was one of the most effective and it was frequently used until it was later replaced. This gun is responsible for many of the deaths that happened throughout a substantial amount of the early 1900s. We now are moving into an area that has so many very interesting taxidermy pieces. Now, again, if taxidermy is not your thing, just go ahead and skip through this one. I completely understand, but wow. <laughs> Okay, that thing growled like as soon as I came in and it, it scared me a little bit. I'm just gonna be very honest. I kind of went, oh, oh. But I think that the reason why places like this are important because I understand the hesitation with a lot of people seeing taxidermy animals. That means that an animal had to die so that we can have a stuffed animal here. However, places like this, oh, it, it's going again, it's going again. Places like this are actually very important because you're able to see the animals in an up close way that is also safe. Safety is key. So by looking at these, we're able to notice things that otherwise we wouldn't have the opportunity to see. And as we do, we can also look at the placards on the bottom to learn more about the animals themselves. Now, I'm gonna just let you know, after seeing some of the animals at some places like this, that I've been just like, oh, it's so cute, and then reading the sign saying, uh, very scary, yeah, I have learned that even though in the wild it might be super fun to look at something from a distance, there are certain animals that you do need to be not letting their cuteness fool you. That's for sure. So as we go through here, I'll show you a few of the different things that you can learn from the signs in this section. And I'm pretty sure that there's gonna be more sounds because it's still pretty dark in here. Now I will say I'm pretty fortunate that I have seen some of these in the wild. For example, this guy back here, the mountain goat. So, so neat. However, being able to come here and then read the signs again to learn a little bit more while also sitting in front of the creature, you don't have those little pop-up notes that happen in nature. So now I have some new brain wrinkles the next time I see one again. So I need to go back to Mount Evans. I need to go back. Now this section also tells us a little bit more about how some of these animals that have been hunted in the wild have been used in a practical way by the Native Americans. I always think that it's important to circle back to the first peoples because they were here and they were paving the way through all of this craziness before most of us even knew what some of these animals were. And they were using them in a very resourceful way and also were defending themselves against some of them with what we consider primitive tools. However, they were surviving and thriving doing so. So the cases that we see here show us some of the leather work that they've done through braining and then also some of the other items that they would have used in their villages. But I think that it's very interesting to see how these two galleries kind of go hand in hand based on some of the usage, but also kind of tell a bigger story. For example, a while ago we were looking at all of the guns, but the Native Americans actually were using arrowheads for their hunting. And there's an extensive collection here that you can see, and they are amazing. In addition, you can find many of the unique 
kinds of pottery that were used in addition to mortars and pestles and other items that they would have used around their camps. Elaborate beadwork became part of the everyday culture within the Native American community or the indigenous community. But each of these items, the leather that was actually used was formed through an amazing process. If you ever have the opportunity to go onto a reservation whenever they're doing one of their special events and they're displaying some of these practices, please do. It's very neat to watch, but also to learn about why they use certain things. For example, the leather that we are looking at right now has withstood the test of time like no other and it's because of the techniques that they used they also believed in using every part of an animal and so whenever they would have to actually go and kill something for food they would make sure that they used everything from the bones to the bladder to the hide every single thing oh wow wasn't ready for this wasn't expecting this at all last room really interesting again we could see the variety we could learn this is next level. In fact, this is so next level that they have to have a book for it. Look at this. All of these numbers are individual items. And this is what they look like in person. But there's more. But there's more. Pretty cool, right? But that's still not all. You can not only see what the birds look like, but also this. All of the individual eggs. Wow. In fact, this collection room reminds me a lot of the Smithsonian collection room because there's just such a vast number of different species and kinds and styles and colors. It's so fabulous. But that's not the only thing that's in here. There's also this guy. <laughs> He's a Kodiak bear. And then an Alaskan polar bear. A and, and then this polar bear, which stands nine feet tall. But the thing that really caught my attention when I walked into the room is the one elusive animal that I'm yet to see in person up close. And I'm kind of happy about that, but I've seen them from a distance and they're just so cool. The good old Bullwinkle, the moose. But in this gallery, you'll also find beautiful butterflies, a large array of massive fish, and the gallery just keeps on going and going and going. This is cool. This is very cool. And as we keep going, we actually get to this section, which is forestry throughout the ages. And here you find a lot of really interesting things that have to do with conservation and the forestry service. I'm really curious as to what this is. Let's go look. Oh, this is very neat. These are all of the different trees and it shows you a section of them cut out so you could see what their patterns and rings look like and also the coloration. And each one of these has the name and then also the scientific name on them. Very neat. But on this wall, they actually have what the common trees of Missouri are. And then you can see on each one of these what they look like and then also what their leaves look like. Let's go into the conservation department for the Missouri Department of Conservation, right inside here. Of course, as soon as we walk in, there is a video that you can sit and watch, but there's also some historic photos, which I am very excited about because at least a couple of these places look kind of familiar. I'm gonna see if I'm right. Now, initially I thought that this was the fire tower located out at the Ruth and Paul Henning, but it is not. This was a different one. And this one was located near Sullivan in 1944. Now through conservation, they were able to convince landowners that a major part of keeping their lands out of fire's way would actually be to plant trees. And so this is in 1952, it's a nursery worker. They're actually putting together short leaf pine seedlings and they're going to ship them out to private owners. This is what it looked like when they had to actually battle the forest fires in this area. And you can see that there wasn't a lot that they could do in way of doing this. So this was in 1945 right here. A lot has changed 
definitely in Missouri since this. Now conservation has a lot of levels to it and this video is not the video for us to break down each and every one of them. However, you have to plant trees to protect trees and I know that sounds super counterproductive but it actually is true. They also help with water washes and flooding and doing other things like that. They provide a habitat for a lot of creatures and therefore they foster a lot of positive growth. But one of the other things that happened to be a benefit of them taking a proactive stance for conservation was also that they had scheduled like choppings and that was super helpful because it provided a service and a product for people but also replenished what they were taking away and I've seen this throughout the rest of the country in various places especially places that have a heavy logging industry they actively are participating in conservation and I know that sounds really like opposite but but it's true this is another great space because it is interactive. You can come in here and learn a bit more about various aspects of conservation and how you can make a difference. And you can see here different kinds of squares that you can pull up and you can create very interesting things and scenarios all while seeing what your environmental footprint happens to be. Another item here is which uses more water, automatic or manual faucets, and we get to find out for ourselves. So if we go to the automatic, okay, and three seconds. Now, if I go over here and turn on the water, that would be a very fast turn. I, I can't even get my hands under it before I've already used three seconds. So automatic definitely was better. I think things like this are great because they just challenge us to think outside the box of what we're used to. And in doing so, we learn a little bit. For example, I had no idea about the automatic water thing, but that kind of makes sense, you know? It kind of makes sense. But with that, we're going to be moving into the history of the School of the Ozarks. And I'm really excited about that because, well, you saw the campus at the very beginning of the video. It's gorgeous, it's beautiful. I really enjoy coming here and I think you would too, but let's learn a little more. This is actually a cornerstone of Mitchell Hall. And this is a picture of Mitchell Hall right here. Now, School of the Ozarks was developed with a lot of really great principles behind it. And as I said earlier in the video, the kids who come here actually work their way through college for their tuition. And so I think it's a really great concept and it allows them to get a quality education, but at the same time not accrue lots of student loan debt. And I think that that's great because then they can move forth with a skill that is practical and can immediately go into the workforce and be ahead of the curve. So that's pretty neat, right? I think so but around here you'll see all these historic photos and there's actually two offices that we're going to peek into right now. In fact, a growing campus, 1915 to 1950. Here you can find the major events, including the school opening and it opened in 1915 in its new location. The enrollment of boarding students is the largest the school had ever known since becoming a high school. That's right, a high school. And then as it continues to go forward, you'll notice that there was a change in the positioning in 1921. And then in 1930, Dobbins Hall, formerly the State of Maine building and a symbol of the school for many years actually caught fire. It's oil treated logs and asphalt roof were burning all to pieces within less than one hour. The school had to cease to enroll eighth graders because of the improved rule schools in 1932, and it became a permanent cannery in 1938. By 1940, Foster and McCarthy Hall and its new dormitory for boys was constructed, and then the girls' dormitory was constructed in 1942. So lots of events going on right here, and you heard that right. At one point in time, they actually had high schoolers here. But as you kind of look around, you'll see some faces that have been important over the years. Now, whenever you come into the school, they actually give you a map to kind of show you where you're going if you ask for one. This is what the original campus looked like versus this is what it looks like now. A lot of changes have been made. A lot more things have been incorporated. Now this next office we're going to look at is a reproduction of Dr. M. Graham Clark's office and he was called the Wizard of the Ozarks. And here you will find the various commendations and plaques and things like that that he had received throughout the years. This is what his desk would have looked like. And you can see he has the kidney bean desk instead of a standard 
like rectangular one, which was kind of interesting, I thought. So who was Mr. Clark? That's a good question. Actually, after 1942, they made some changes. A new face needed to be seen in front of the eyes of all, and he became that person. He was loyal to the college for many years and even remained active even after his retirement all the way up until his passing in 2001. So it started out as a boarding school, then turned into a junior college, and then the college that we know it to be today. Along the way, the principles have all remained very similar. They have built their backbone on belief in family and faith, and I think it's very interesting to see the evolution through this one room where you can put everything kind of into perspective. Now, dorm life has changed throughout the years quite a bit. This was in 1909, and this was the Mitchell Hall Boys Dormitory. You can see it was pretty bare bones, a bunch of people just posing for a picture. In 1951, the girls' dormitory at McDonald Hospital actually looked like this. Now this is kind of a fuzzier picture, but there were only two beds in each room and you could see each person had their own individual space. Now, in more modern days, there is a bunk bed system, there's a little living situation where you have a little bit more room to spread out. And this was taken actually in 2017 of an actual dorm room here on campus. But the 1980s have been captured in this display right here. You can see what an 80s dorm room might have looked like, and you can probably see the kids that stayed in this one liked some McDonald's quite a bit. But as you're moving around, they did have the bunk beds, they had a nice window, one desk that they could share, two dressers, a small record player, a couple of fun posters of things that they might have been interested in, you know, college. I think it just goes to show that while we are on a college campus and while we are enjoying all of the different things here, there's a life that's going on while we're just living in our lives kind of at the same time. And all of these kids here work super, super hard to provide not only the really cool things that we can go into like the Keter Center, but also they are the gears that grind, that move the campus forward. Now we move into a different area which actually includes Mr. Dewey Short. Dewey Short was a US congressman between 1929 and 1931, and then again from 1935 to 1956. This is what his congressional area might have looked like, and then along the way you find some very interesting historic photos. Now there is a visitor center over by Table Rock that is called the Dewey Short Visitor Center, and um, it's named after this guy. And they don't talk a lot about Mr. Dewey Short while you're actually at the Dewey Short, just a very brief space. But here you can get a much more like overall broad look at who he was, what he did, and also some of the interesting things along the way. In fact, here is that very project that we were just talking about at Table Rock, and this is the last bucket of concrete. It was poured May 24th, 1955. Now, I have done a video about the Dewey Short, so I encourage you to go check it out so you can learn a little bit more about the dam itself. But this was very, very important to this area. Along the way, we find the Missouri Pacific Lines and some very nice representation of what it would have been like to go to a train station. In fact, inside this office right here, you can see various parts of the railroad operation, and then also some of the things that they would have needed in this office. Now, here is something pretty interesting. That is a Morse relay, and then also they have resonator sounders, and then straight keys. And this is where it gets fun. So right beyond that, they have this, which tells you about international Morse code. And the dashes and the dots create various letters and also numbers. And so if you needed to contact somebody or send a message, this is how you would do it because they didn't have the ability to just send an email. So you would have to do it through this. And there were no typos. <laughs> typos were a big no-no, so you had to actually know what you were doing. Now on the receiving end of that, you also had to be paying very close attention. If it went did did did, you needed to know that it went did 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 and not did did did. I, I know that's a really primitive version of Morse code, but realistically, the longs and the shorts, you would have to be paying attention, and then there would be a pause before the next long and short. That would be a lot, but that was the way that we communicated through this very interesting early primitive email system that we had, and that would be how we would convey messages from point A to point B in some very important times. 
In addition to communicating through Morse code, they also had early telephones. And this is what the operator station would have looked like. Now, if you wanted to connect with someone, you didn't just dial their number directly. You would actually do the little thing where you pick up the phone and then you ring it and that would send you to the operator. You would then tell them who you want to be connected with. And they would be sitting in a row like this and then would do the hard work of connecting you to whoever it was that you were wanting to speak to. Now in a world where now we value privacy the way that we do, it's kind of interesting to know this is how the phone started out because not only were you able to hear the other person, but the operator technically could too. And so, yeah, you didn't want to say anything too crazy. Now echoing that first gallery that we walked into, the Ozark Mountain Music Pioneers Hall of Fame is on this, the third floor. We actually have a native from the Powell, Missouri area. And this was for the song, I'll Fly Away. There's also a little documentary here that you can sit down and watch. It's pretty interesting. I watched a couple pieces of it and there's some great interviews in there for sure. So check that out. We will circle back to music in just a minute, but check this out. Are you a fisherman? Do you like fishing? Well, this section is definitely for you. Of course, we all know that Bass Pro was developed right here in Missouri. And so it is only fitting that they have an epic display of all things fishing right here at the Ralph Foster. Standing opposite of the Hall of Fame, we have the Ozark Mountain Folklore Riders. Each one of them looks like they are hand carved and they have the person that they are representing on them. And then right below, they actually have some information about their contributions and why they have been included in this listing. Also included in this list is Laura Ingalls Wilder. And she was originally born in Wisconsin, but they have a home here in Missouri that is based off of her stories and she was the one responsible for the little house on the prairie. One of the most noted men here in the Branson community is actually Harold Bell Wright. He created the tale which still is portrayed here in the Ozarks, that is the Shepherd of the Hills. Okay guys, let's take it back to the music one more time and see this display. Now, Branson of course is known for the bright lights on the 76 Boulevard and all of the live music, but throughout the years, you have seen a variety of famous faces actually come through Branson through these shows. This lady right here is actually Mary Hershend and her family is responsible for Silver Dollar City, which has of course brought so many people to this community. They have long-standing friendships and relationships with the community and her and her family have brought so much joy to so many faces. In this case, you can find the Plummer family and Bob Mabe. You can even find some old eight tracks in here. Shoji Chibuchi, whenever he was actually on the Grand Ole Opry, of course he's had a long-standing show here in Branson and is super talented. A lot of different items from the Plummer family, and the Plummer family had a good fun show that always had a good comedic approach to it. Records from the Foggy River Boys and some of their biggest songs. The Bald Knobbers are right beside this, of course taking that name that is oh so famous here in the Ozarks and turning it into something that is known as entertainment. Of course, the Williams brothers have performed here and Andy Williams had a long-standing Christmas show. You can see throughout the photos that people like Captain Kangaroo and Cookie Bear and others have come alongside and been a part of the action. Costumes from Droopy Drawers, from the Bald Knobbers, and Roy Clark right here. Of course, Roy Clark most famously is known for his work in Hee 
Yamaha and other productions, but he did spend a large portion of time here in Branson. And in this thing on the back here, you can actually see what the 76 Boulevard in 1986 would have looked like, which is a lot different than it is now. Right next to that, some Boxcar Willie autographed albums. Here you have Barbara Fairchild. This was one of her costumes. Doug Gabriel right here, always with the sparkles and rhinestones. Here is Mo Bandy's set of boots in the front. And on this is the Branson Brothers. Now I remember seeing the Branson Brothers when they used to perform out at Silver Dollar City and I always enjoyed them. They were a good show. But standing tall next to them is Mickey Gilly right here. Now, if you're interested in finding out more information about Branson and the numerous performers from here, but also some of the history, I definitely encourage you to go downtown to the Centennial Museum. This museum and that museum play hand in hand together and really tell the story of this area quite well. And it's definitely something I would encourage you to check out. Now that is a free museum. So whenever you're down there, the hardest part's gonna be the parking because well, it's crowded down there. But at the same time, you can see more costumes, you can find more history, and there's some little nuggets that you're gonna want to check out there too. Oh, but wait, wait, we're not done yet. We're, we're down on the first floor, yes, but there's some other stuff you gotta see. Dolls, dolls, lots of dolls. I wouldn't want to be in this room at night probably because there's so many eyes looking at you, but wow, these are so cool. But it's not just the dolls, there are also doll houses here and erector sets and beautiful pieces that have taken a long time to put together. I mean, look at the detail in each and every room. And again, because there are rows upon rows upon rows of these, there's no way I can show you each and every one of them. So I'm gonna show you a few of my favorites that I'm seeing and just know there are hundreds of these for you guys just waiting to be found. As you can see, dolls from around the world, dolls in every shape, size, and style. And you can even see how some of them were created through the placards, and it's fascinating. But there's a few other things in here also that I wanted to touch on before we get to the car. I know, I built up the car because I'm so excited about it, but there's a lot of cool stuff here. And I would definitely dedicate a few hours if you are a brain wrinkle kind of person to this place, because there's lots to be explored in three floors. What is this? Oh my goodness, it is a full on circus. I am so excited right now. I love circuses. I think that they're so fun and I've watched a lot of documentaries on them because it's just interesting to see how they came about and how they grew and ultimately how they had to shift and change. But being able to see this in its simplicity, it's just really, really neat. Now just beyond that, there are some other circus sets. These are all iron, however, really cool. Well, guys, we have finally made it here. And guess what? Here is the official Beverly Hillbillies car. And something that I just noticed is kind of cool. Look at this. You can actually take a photo inside of the car for like $20. And all they have to do is just come out here and set you up. And then you have a photo in the back also of the original cast. So isn't that neat? 
But again, why is this car here in Branson? Guys, there's a couple of reasons why the Beverly Hillbillies car is here in Branson, and we talked about a little bit previously on the channel. Have you ever heard of the Ruth and Paul Henning uh, conservation area outside of town? Well, Mr. Paul Henning actually had purchased land in this area and was a producer, and he produced the Beverly Hillbillies along with several other shows at that time. And whenever he did, the Beverly Hillbillies actually took a trip and came to Branson and went to Silver Dollar City and kind of went around town to some other locations as well. So it's only fitting that the car lives here where their legacy continues on. Now there are some really really easy to access ways to find those episodes when the Beverly Hillbillies were here in the Branson area and I encourage you to do that but for now let's take a closer look because this is so cool. Now along this way right here, you can actually find some really cool things, but one of the things that you can do is use this QR code and you can listen to the ballad of Jed Clampett, otherwise known as the theme song. These are all the lyrics right here. Now this is a cool photo though right here. This one is everything. You can look at the joy on this face right here as this car is actually being brought to its current location. And this is Mr. Paul Henning himself. Now, in addition, you can go through these and read the bios of each person and kind of a follow-up as to what they did after the Beverly Hillbillies. And it's, it's pretty neat to see. In fact, one of the most interesting to me was Granny. Granny, despite looking like a grandma, was actually not as old as you might have thought her to be by watching the show. And it was fascinating to see how she would transform into this character for this production. One last thing before we call this video a video and um, wrap it up. If you are interested in finding out more about Paul Henning, the man who brought the Beverly Hillbillies to Branson, I encourage you to go out and check out the Ruth and Paul Henning Conservation Area. They have some great hiking there. I actually have a couple videos from that region. Definitely something that is fun and a little bit different and off the beaten path just a little bit, but it gets you back to the grass roots that brought Paul to this area in the first place. He said that one of the reasons why he wanted the Beverly Hillbillies to come to Branson was because it just seemed like they fit. They seemed like they fit in this Ozark region with all this beautiful rolling landscape. He had fallen in love with the area and just knew that this was the perfect place for the Beverly Hillbillies to return to the Ozarks. Okay guys, the bells are ringing. We have just completed this beautiful, wonderful, amazing museum, the Ralph Foster, here at Hard Work U, the College of the Ozarks. I hope you have enjoyed coming along with me to see the history unfold before our very eyes. The capping off at the very end with Beverly Hillbilly's car was definitely big, and I know that I enjoyed it. I hope you did too. Remember guys, we're not here for a long time, but we are here for a good time. And well, Hard Work U, Despite being a little bit of work to get here, super, super that. Until next time, guys. Bye.